Hi folks, so today we're going to discuss enlightenment, both the Western and the Buddhist kind, and compare them. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association, that's secularbuddhism.org. And today we're going to discuss enlightenment. What does it mean in a Western context and a Buddhist context? And how do those compare? If these kinds of topics interest you, please consider subscribing to Doug Secular Dharma. You can do it in various ways. There are various boxes and banners on the screen or down below if you're on YouTube. We'll aim to have roughly one video a week out on Mondays. So if these kinds of topics interest you, please consider subscribing. So enlightenment. What does it really mean in a European context as well as a Buddhist context? Now, as we know, enlightenment is one of the standard translations for nirvana or nirvana in, a, in Buddhism. It's not a great translation, because the word nirvana really means extinguishing or blowing out. That is, the extinguishment or blowing out of the fires of greed, hatred, and ignorance. And the Buddha was called the Buddha because he was awakened. That's what the term Buddha means, is the awakened one. So both these terms, blowing out and awakening, don't really have anything to do with light or enlightenment per se. Or so it would seem. There are certain similarities that we'll try to tease out as we go along. So let's begin with the European Enlightenment and where that notion came from of Enlightenment and what its history is. So during the Middle Ages, knowledge of classical Greece and Rome was largely lost in the West. And what, what substituted for it were um, church teachings. So for instance, if you were to be a learned person during the early to middle Middle Ages, basically you would have been taught in a monastery. You might have read a few works out of Greek, but very, very little. Mostly what you would be doing is reading the Bible. But during the uh, beginning around the 10th century in, in Spain, in Toledo in Spain, these works began to be translated back out of Arabic and into Latin. And eventually, as, these translation, uh, as the translation effort gained steam, many people were able to go into areas of the Middle East, into areas of modern-day Turkey, and recover um, the original uh, Greek texts, and then translate those into Latin as well. Some of this culminated, we could say culminated, around the 13th century, where St. Thomas Aquinas actually sort of reformed uh, Catholic Christianity based on the works of Aristotle, which were really new to Europe at that time. But these discoveries and translations opened the door to the fact that there was more known in the world than was in the Bible alone. During the early Middle Ages, Middle Middle Ages, there was the notion that basically all human knowledge was biblical knowledge. And the, the translation effort helped to explode that notion. A little bit later, we get into uh, the, the early pre-scientific or proto-scientific advances of people like Nicholas Copernicus and in Galileo Galilei in the, in the 15th and 16th centuries, where they began doing original, or Galileo began doing original experiments for the first time, really, to discover things that were not known in the Bible. As well, Copernicus, his notion that the that the earth went around the sun, of course, contradicted certain aspects of biblical teachings as well. And in the 16th and 17th century, you have the issue of the, Refor the, the, the Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation in Europe. Basically, a century, more than a century of religious warfare that really, I think, shook a lot of people's uh, faith or belief in the idea that uh, that there was something good about theocracy, that religious people really had all the answers. There was a sense that this kind of, of, of complete power given to religious figures led to corruption, led to bad practices, led to something that needed to be cleaned up. That there needed to be, as it were, a secular space somewhere, and that there were significant problems with having religion melded with government the way it had been for many, many centuries. And in the 17th century, we have the first detailed studies of the Bible as a human text really in world history. This was really sort of stemmed out of earlier, the earlier attempts to translate uh, Greek texts out of Arabic and then later on Greek into Latin. The notion that you really had to try to find what the original text was like. Well, those same techniques that were used in translating texts out of the Arabic Middle East and Arabic Spain were then later transferred to biblical criticism. And what was discovered was that, that the Bible was, was full of contradictions, was full of, there, that there were many, many different editions of the Bible, that there were many, many different roots to which the Bible went back. There wasn't one single Bible that all of them came from, or at least if there were, it was not something that could be found. All of these kinds of different threads of biblical criticism, um, a discovery of, of classical learning plus scientific awareness, led to what we might call 
a disenchantment of the world. Whereas earlier the world had been, had been seen in a sort of an enchanted light, as a sort of a magical place ruled by God and other supernatural beings, now in the, in the European Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries, the world was seen as less an enchanted place and more a place that could be understood rationally by experiment and reason. So in a European context, enlightenment really meant disenchantment with the supernatural, or at least disinterest in it. Now what about Buddhist enlightenment? That's quite a different thing. Because whereas a European enlightenment was really a social, a social, socio-political kind of movement among many, many people seeing how objective experiment led to a disenchantment of the world, a Buddhist enlightenment is rather an internal psychological matter. It comes after the awareness that sense pleasures are temporary that pains are temporary, that everything that we see in life is temporary. It comes after an awareness that we ourselves are always changing, our opinions are changing, that we are not ourselves under our complete control at any time, that there isn't a permanent self to, to turn to. There's no permanent object of refuge that we can turn to within daily life. And these kind of psychological truths, these kinds of truths that we come to, aware, that we come to be aware of in daily life, lead to what we might call a disenchantment with the world. And here, the, the Buddhist notion, notion of disenchantment meant a non-clinging to, a non-identification with all aspects of reality. That is to say, by being disenchanted with the world, what we mean is that we cease to identify with the world. We cease to feel that the world is mine, that aspects of the world are mine, that I am these things that I am reflected in these things. In that sense, both the European notion of enlightenment and the Buddhist notion of enlightenment come from the same root idea of disenchantment, of overcoming certain kinds of delusions that we have about the way things are. In the European enlightenment, these were delusions about the way the external world works, that the external world is not dominated by supernatural beings. In the Buddhist context, this, this disillusion, this this removal of delusion is rather a removal of the, of the psychological notion of delusion in believing that there are permanent things in the world that we can cling to and identify with. And that through doing that, through clinging to external things, we can somehow come to a state of, of permanent happiness. So in both senses, what we're talking about is a kind of disillusion. And I think it's a healthy disillusion in both cases, a disillusion that moves us from a position of being unaware of the way the world works into a wiser state of being. If thinking about the world in this way interests you, and if you find it healthy and useful to do so, please consider subscribing. We'll try to aim to have about a video a week out on a, a, a whole range of topics about Buddhism, early Buddhism, uh, both introductory and more advanced, trying to give you ways to see the world in a wiser, kinder, less stressful way. And please put any comments or questions uh, down below. I always love reading them. And that way you can also have discussions with other people on the channel. So I'm really glad you're here. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you've been here for a while, then thanks for coming back. And we'll catch you on the next one. Again, thanks so much.